for it is time for member statement the member from oxford thank you very much mr speaker mr speaker i'm pleased to rise today to celebrate Dutch Heritage Month, and I want to recognize the Council General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Anne van Leeuwen, and all of the people who are here at Queen's Park for this important occasion. In, it is in this month that we recognize the important contributions that Dutch Canadians have made to the economic, political, social, and cultural development of Ontario's, Ontario society. May is historically for the Dutch Canadian community. Every year, on May the 5th, the Netherlands celebrates Liberation Day. It's a celebration of freedom and all of those who put their lives on the line to help a nation freeing them from oppression. I remember my mother's stories about liberation. The efforts of those Canadian soldiers are the reason that my father later came to Canada and the reason that Canada and the Netherlands have such a strong friendship to this day. The people of, ne of Netherlands have not forgotten the sacrifices of our soldiers and neither should we. Though this was not a battle on our home front, the impact that our veterans made must be remembered and celebrated. As Canadians, we must strive to keep the memory of these heroes' sacrifices alive. We must continue to celebrate Holland's liberation and take pride in our veterans' victories and their lives. As a Dutch Canadian and a person born liberated because of their efforts, I want to say to those veterans, thank you. We will always be indebted to you, and it is because of you that we are celebrating today. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lyme disease statement. November of 2014, it was the first time I rose in this house to speak about Lyme disease in Ontario. Back then, I talked about people with good jobs who were being forced into poverty because they were being forced to pay for their own medical care. In 2014, I believe, as I continue to believe today, no one in Ontario should have to choose between living in poverty and decent health care. Mr. Speaker, we must do better. I, I still speak with Amanda Wilson, the resident from Fort Erie, who continues to suffer from Lyme disease. Though I must say I'm incredibly proud of her, she fought the disease and now she organizes to help others who are just like her. But she is one of the people who have lost her livelihood because of this disease. We, Mr. Speaker, we cannot let the people of Ontario suffering from Lyme disease continue to feel like they are alone. We need a stronger strategy, one that combines prevention, treatment, and education. Ontario is home to some of the most gifted doctors in the world, and we need to equip them with the tools they need to help people suffering from Lyme disease. Mr. Speaker, it's, all, it's been almost three years since I first rose and spoke on the issue of Lyme disease in this House. Today, I say to this government, has not done enough. The Premier and her Cabinet can do better. They must do better. The people of the province of Ontario are counting on them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Mississauga, Arendale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are very lucky in my riding of Mississauga, Arendale to have the University of Toronto Mississauga campus, which provides world-class education at this beautiful campus. It is interesting to note the university's growth from just over 6,000 students in 2000 to over 13,500 students today, many of them international students. Furthermore, an economic impact report prepared by KPMG states that the economic contribution of UTM is about 1.3 billion annually to the local and provincial economy. It is important to highlight some of the investment that our government has made to keep the UTM campus expanding and evolving to meet contemporary needs. This includes the eight major renovations which has happened at UTM over the past decade. The project is an expansion of the North Building and is partly funded by our provincial government, which has contributed about 52.5 million. I personally have the privilege of seeing the progress made on a daily basis during my morning walk. Another such project involved UTM 63 labs on the William Davis building. Two labs will be rebuilt with the rem remainder receiving improvements to the HVAC and electrical systems. 
This comes partly thanks to $14.3 million invested from the provincial government. It is inspiring to see that our government remains committed to improving education through infrastructure and technological investment, especially at the gorgeous GTM campus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements. Member from Bruce Gray, Owen South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to pay tribute to a great constituent who has served our province and his community with distinction, retired Constable Andrew Wilder. Drew recently retired after 30 years of serving in the Ontario Provincial Police. In addition to his public service, Drew has dedicated many years to service in the community through St. John Ambulance, where he has served as a chair for Grey Bruce, Bruce Huron Branch. In fact, there are three generations of the Wilder family volunteering for St. John Ambulance in Grey Bruce and Huron counties. Through his leadership, Drew helped to secure a new training facility for St. John Ambulance in Hanover. As members are aware, there are 42 St. John Ambulance Divisions from Sault Ste. Marie to Niagara Falls and some 1,800 volunteers who contribute 175,000 volunteer hours every year. In addition to Drew's work with St. John Ambulance, he also has dedicated many hours volunteering in various other committees, including the boards of Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the Children's Aid Society. He is also a proud supporter of military and all emergency services personnel and initiatives. In 2012, Drew was a recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, in addition to have been made the Member of Order of Merit for his many notable and exceptional services. Later this month, Drew will be made an officer in the most venerable order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem at a ceremony at Queen's Park. With Drew's lifelong volunteer efforts and stellar work ethic and integrity, I think there could not have been a better candidate for the order. Speaker, I am proud of the work of Drew and all of the volunteers at St. John Ambulance. They're helping to make our community safer. I invite the members to join me in extending our heartfelt thanks to Drew Wilder for his dedication and commitment to our province and wish him continued success in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to invite the whole community to a celebration to uh, uh, pay homage to Mr. Michel Dallaire, who left us a few years ago. He was a poet, a novelist, a photographer, and he wrote with lots of talent. He knew what was the beautiful in his photography. He lives behind impress, impressive work and also many collaborations and uh, participation in the community. It is, death is a loss for the whole community, and we are giving a last homage to his artists who left too early. On Friday, the 19th of May, from 6 to 8 p.m. on the Théâtre de l'Ontario at the Collège Boreal in Sudbury. If you cannot be present, and if you want to give thanks to Michel, you can send a message or a video message to Facebook, hoping to see you in large numbers for his commemoration of a man who touched the hearts of so many people thanks to his words, his photos, and also his great generosity. Michel was one of my friends, and I'm very sad that he left us. ceremony in memory of Michel Dallaire at the TNO on Boreal campus in Sudbury on Friday, May 19, from 4 till 9. 4 till 6. Thank you, Speaker. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Members, statement from the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to tell you and members of this House about Nutrition for Learning. This is a vital organization in my region that's feeding hundreds of children every day. A full stomach is essential for good learning, and with this breakfast program, students in Kitchener-Waterloo are able to have a healthy breakfast that prepares them to focus and engage at school. Nutrition for Learning administers 137 programs with healthy and nutritious food for students in my region. And with the help of provincial funding in this year's balanced budget, it ensures that kids in KW schools continue to have a balanced breakfast. Recently, Speaker, I visited St. John's Catholic School in my riding of Kitchener Centre. It's one of the schools that's benefiting from the program. At the breakfast gathering, Speaker, there was fresh fruit, yogurt, and bagels and cheese. I spoke to one young girl from Eritrea. Her name is Victoria. She told me that her mother leaves for work at about 6 a.m. every morning. Victoria gets dropped off at a babysitter, but there are other kids there, and she sometimes doesn't get enough to eat. She was often going to school on an empty stomach. But since she started participating in the Nutrition for Learning Breakfast Club, she told me that she's now having breakfast every day, 
Her tummy doesn't hurt anymore, and she feels energized and ready to learn. Funding for Nutrition for Learning was included in this year's budget, and the executive director, Mary Dalton, couldn't be happier, and nor could we. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Niagara West Glenbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In this House, we have all grown increasingly aware of the opioid crisis in Ontario. The Ontario Drug Policy Research Network notes that over the past year, the increase in opioid overdoses has grown substantially. I do want to acknowledge the government's efforts in trying to get a grip on this troubling trend, and I applaud the move to better tracking. I'm pleased for my colleagues in Ottawa to hear that $2.5 million has been pledged to fund a local harm reduction strategy in their community. At the same time, I want this government to be aware that the opioid crisis also exists outside of Ontario's larger cities. Constituents from my riding are concerned that they're being ignored by a focus on, on, on Toronto and on Ottawa. But in the Niagara regions, deaths from opioid increases have all, all, almost doubled since 2009, rising from 16 to 29. ER visits related to opioids climbed to 618 from 418. This past November, an individual died from a car fentanyl, car fentanyl overdose. This drug is 100 times more potent than fentanyl, which is in itself many times stronger than heroin. In 2016, our region also saw 10 pharmacy robberies related to the opioid crisis. I call on this government to be proactive rather than reactive and partner with our local communities to curb this crisis sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Member Davis, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For many, Mother's Day is a special opportunity to say thank you to mothers, sisters, aunts, even mentors who often take a leadership role in our lives. However, Mother's Day is not always a happy occasion for everyone. And yesterday, I joined women in Kingston from across the province to remember and honour those who have been impacted by preeclampsia in the promised walk for preeclampsia. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Jamie Davies, or Davis for her work in organizing this community's first preeclampsia walk, only one in three in Canada, to raise awareness and support those who suffer from the condition. Women who have been in affected in the world amount to roughly 10 million, and 500,000 babies are lost each year. As a mother myself, I know what a wonderful and sacred gift a child is. I remember vividly the excitement, the nerves that a pregnancy brings. But for those women who have been diagnosed with preeclampsia, what should be a joyous event can become something entirely different. Sponsored by the Mothers Program, this event connected people from around the province, together with families driving as far as Windsor and Font Hill to be there. I was deeply in, impacted, and I will remain impacted by the stories that I heard yesterday. Working together to support events like this, we can raise awareness and hopefully one day eventually find a support and a cure for preeclampsia. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Dufferin Calgary. Thank you, Speaker. It is unacceptable that in Peel Region in the last 36 months, more than 33 adults who have a developmental disability have been abandoned by their family. It is unacceptable that individuals who have a developmental disability are cut off from the Special Services at Home funding program when they turn age 18 and therefore have no immediate funding. It is unacceptable that there are 1,105 individuals who have a developmental disability waiting for funding for day supports and respite services. It is unacceptable that there are more than 65 people in the then existing pressures list who have been identified by the Ministry of Community and Social Services as requiring a high level of support but there are no longer secure funding available. It is unacceptable while the Ministry of Community and Social Services reports that they have provided funding for 800 residential supports across the province, the Peel region only received an estimated supports for 12. It is unacceptable that the new funding promised by the community to support an additional 600 adults has been diverted by the ministry to pay for transitional aged youth. It is unacceptable. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore time for reports by committees. The member from Etobicoke.